Chancellor. Please uh, join, uh, unmute your speaker and welcome to uh, the speaker. Uh, Professor Christian. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Christian uh, Bartokji, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I don't know if it is uh, in Germany, it is uh, morning or evening? Morning. Morning. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Welcome, sir. It is uh, very nice of you and uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, going to give a webinar on uh, Mahatma Gandhi and uh, uh, this Narma uh, Birth Principles of International Law. Uh, it was uh, very nice of you, and uh, uh, we, we are very happy that you are uh, Gandhi Peace Foundation director there in uh, Germany. And uh, it was in uh, Place that it is in the German Berlin. Uh, it is. Uh, I was there in German uh, Berlin for some time, uh, a few days uh, uh, in the year 2004, and uh, it was a very beautiful city. And uh, and uh, I saw the uh, Great Wall of uh, separating uh, West Germany and East Germany also. <laughs> so very nice of you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, enlightening us on this Mahatma Gandhi principles. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your uh, welcome address to our speaker. Uh, now I'm just uh, going to introduce uh, our uh, speaker. Uh, just a couple of minutes I will take. Uh, so welcome to all participants, attendees from India and abroad. Uh, it is a good morning in Berlin and a good afternoon in India. Uh, today's speaker is a, a well-known scholar as a Professor Christian Bartok. He is a president of a Gandhi Information Center, Berlin. And he is also uh, is associated with the uh, is Free University, Berlin. Uh, is is it more than around 30 years of his association with the university? He is a political uh, academician and also as an educationist. And uh, he worked very uh, deeply, details, and uh, academically his uh, work on uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, he also as a uh, is member of a, a Indo-German society, our a speaker in Berlin. Uh, he's a promoting the Gandhian uh, principles of a non-violence, uh, resi non-violence resistance, Satyagraha, and many other uh, through his scholarly work uh, around the world. He's very uh, well known for his uh, work on uh, uh, his Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Loy, uh, Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy, the non-violence and uh, uh, non-resistance. So he used uh, uh, his uh, Gandhian Satyagraha as a non-violence, uh, as a tools of uh, uh, his promoting uh, peace through the non-violence way. And he also used uh, Leo Tolstoy doctrine of non-resistance. So his work uh, is a kind of a, a foundational work on Leo Tolstoy and Mahatma Gandhi uh, as a conceptual work, a theoretical foundational work. So this work is a, is, is a kind of a, a foundational work and as a reference for a further work and a many uh, his work uh, after uh, on the, uh, the Mahatma Gandhi th uh, concept of non-violence, Satyagraha and uh, Leo Tolstoy. Uh, many scholars uh, uh, citing and giving reference uh, of uh, our speakers' uh, foundational work. So this is a kind of a, uh, his academic is called the introduction. Uh, our speaker is very uh, interesting, he's a dynamic person and uh, is a personality of uh, uh, his music. Uh, he loved to listen, watch uh, music and also he uh, loved to uh, uh, listen and uh, uh, guzzles. Uh, recently I uh, checked his uh, uh, status 
on social media site. He was listening uh, Ghazal of Tariq uh, Fateli, uh, uh, Fateli as a uh, very uh, popular Ghazal uh, singer. So uh, he understand a little uh, his, uh, Hindi words also, <coughs> I, I think. Uh, his, uh, and uh, his work with the Indo-German society and uh, he's a uh, kind of very close to Indian community uh, in Berlin. And uh, he also like a, a kind of a, a mediator or is a kind of a approaching channel for Indo uh, community, Indian community in German. So that kind of we see the India-German uh, relation, India-German relation is a very kind of a role, is playing a kind of a, a ambassador role as a kind of a, a as a positive progressive role and a, a connecting to communities a, in berlin so this is a kind of a short introduction i'm not going to take a lot of time and now i i say hand over the mic to our speaker i say professor christian Bartol. please i share your work and thought and uh, very important that a uh, Gandhian principle that used in a uh, Nuremberg principle of international law, and uh, these principles are related to international uh, uh, crime committed by uh, war uh, and during the war, uh, Second World War. And so uh, this is also very important work of uh, our speaker uh, as a Nuremberg principle of international law. And these principles say uh, as a as a result of a international commission of law under United Nations. So now I welcome to our speaker for his deliberation. Uh, just welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for your invitation, Dr. Jango, Professor Rao. Thank you for your nice words to introduce me. I think uh, I will use the following 40 minutes to summarize most essentials. Because where was I when uh, Mahatma Gandhi's 150th birthday took place on 2nd October last year? It was in Nuremberg in Bavaria in Germany. And there is a reason for this. I was invited by the German uh, Indian Society and it was an event organized uh, together with the Consulate General of India in Munich, that's right. And I was a uh, speaker, key speaker, but um, it was a wonderful German-Indian friendship event. So I was so happy. And there was a broad understanding of the relevance of the Nuremberg principles in connection with Mahatma Gandhi. So for me, it was a most significant date. And um, the reason for this is the following. Um, we can understand Gandhi nowadays through his writings, which we find in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi through the Gandhi Heritage Portal, which has been organized very well for all researchers in the world. So if we now focus today on the issue, Mahatma Gandhi's comments on the atom bomb first, and then the conclusions which we should draw from these comments and also from the fact that two atom bombs were dropped in 1945, then we should um, try to link these facts with the Nuremberg principles. And one way of linking it has been done by the famous philosopher Günther Anders, the first husband of Hannah Arendt. We all contemporaries of the nuclear age in the tough times of the global pandemic. But 1945 was an epochal threshold to the end time, was crossed in the year 1945. The dropping 
of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki introduced a new and at the same time the final stage of the history of humankind. A new age began on August 6, 1945, the day of Hiroshima, of course, long before through the Manhattan Project. And August 8, 1945, a day rich with associations, the day on which precisely between the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the charter of the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg against crimes against humanity was signed. This day is the most monstrous date. That's what Günter Anders said. The most monstrous date, monstrous like the entire new age. Between the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the charter of the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg against crimes against humanity was signed. And this London charter or Nuremberg Charter was the basis for the Nuremberg trials against the war criminals of Germany, also of the uh, criminals of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, the criminals from Japan. And uh, in 1950, the International Law Commission drafted the mm, Nuremberg Principles. Uh, with respect to the responsibility of heads of state for the crimes, first time in history. And this is certainly uh, of great significance and linked with Mahatma Gandhi. So I start my lecture with uh, Mahatma Gandhi's comments on the atom bomb. And I will go one by one because these comments are so precise and so significant that we should recall them first. Otherwise, we will not understand the significance of the Nuremberg principles for our age. So Mahatma Gandhi was silent for some months after the atom bomb, but then he started to speak. And you can read this in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. So 1946, he answered questions at meetings of teachers and students. Uh, Gandhi said, if anyone says that India can gain independence through the sword, I would patiently hear him, even though I have been preaching truth and nonviolence for the last 20 years for winning Swaraj. Then Gandhiji, full of emotion, referred to violence such as causing destruction with the atom bomb and the victory won thereby, and said that he had applied his mind to this point. He felt that truth and nonviolence were really more powerful than the atom bomb. So this is the first quote. Then, I'm not afraid of the atom bomb, he remarked. While they could cause physical injury, they could not kill their soul. Once they had the determination that they could not be conquered by violence, victory was theirs, for a, more, for a moral protest against evil was itself a victory. In uh, Harijan, February, uh, 19, uh, February 10, 1946, Gandhi summarized, there have been cataclysmic changes in the world. Do I still adhere to my faith in truth and nonviolence? Has not the atom bomb exploded that faith? Not only has it not done so, but it has clearly demonstrated to me that the twins constitute the mightiest force in the world. Before it, the atom bomb is of no effect. The two opposing forces are wholly different in kind. The one moral and spiritual, the other physical and material. The one is infinitely superior to the other, which by its very nature has an end. The force of the spirit is ever progressive and endless. Its full expression makes it unconquerable in the world. In saying this, I know that I have said nothing new. 
I merely bear witness to the fact. What is more, that force resides in everybody, man, woman, and child, irrespective of the color of the skin. Only in many it lies dormant, but it is capable of being awakened by judicious training. It is further to be observed that without the recognition of this truth and due effort to realize it, there is no escape from self-destruction. The remedy lies in every individual training himself for self-expression in every walk of life, irrespective of response by the neighbors. Harijan will, yeah, well, then he referred to Harijan. So the next quote was, uh, how can violence be stopped? It was in May, 1946. The atom bomb, and he said, the atom bomb has not stopped violence. People's hearts are full of it and preparations for a third world war may even be said to be going on. While it would be absurd to say that violence has ever brought peace to mankind, it cannot either be said that violence never achieves anything. That I shall have to repent if I cannot stop violence does not enter into the picture of nonviolence. No man can stop violence, God alone, can do so. Men are but instruments in his hands. Here material means cannot stop violence, but this does not mean that material means should not be employed for the purpose. The deciding factor is God's grace. He works according to his law and therefore violence will also be stopped in accordance with that law. Man does not and can never know God's law fully. Therefore, we have to try as far as lies in our power. I hold that our experiment in nonviolence has succeeded to a fair extent in India. There is therefore no room for the pessimism shown in the question. Finally, Ahimsa is one of the world's great principles which no power on earth can wipe out. Thousands like myself may die in trying to vindicate the ideal, but Ahimsa will never die. And the gospel of Ahimsa can be spread only through believers dying for the cause. In uh, June 1946, Harry John, an English friend posed to Ganeji during a stay at Missouri, the question whether the very frightfulness of the atom bomb would not force nonviolence on the world. If all nations were armed with the atom bomb, they would refrain from using it as it would mean absolute destruction for all concerned. Ganjichi, Ganjichi was of the opinion that it would not. And this was his sentence. The violent man's eyes would be lit up with the prospect of the much greater amount of destruction and death, which he could not, which he could, no, once more. The violent man's eyes would be lit up with the prospect of the much greater amount of destruction and death which he now, which he could now wreak. I repeat again. The violent man's eyes would be lit up with the prospect of the much greater amount of destruction and death, which he could now wreak. So he was not of the opinion that the atom bomb would refrain from using it as it would mean absolute destruction for all concerned. He was not of the opinion. That was 1946. You can read it in the collected works of Hartmann Gandhi. And now the next one. Uh, it was in 7-7-1946. It has been suggested by American friends that the atom bomb will bring in ahimsa, nonviolence, as nothing else can. It will, if it is meant that its destructive power will so disgust the world that it will turn it away from violence for the time being. This is very like a man glutting himself with dainties to the point of nausea and turning away from them only to return with redoubled zeal after the effect of nausea is well over. Precisely in the same manner will the world return to violence with renewed zeal after the effect of disgust is worn out. 
Often does good come out of evil, but that is God's, not man's plan. Man knows that only evil can come out of evil, as good out of good. So far as I can see, the atomic bomb has deadened the finest feeling that has sustained mankind for ages. There used to be the so-called laws of war which made it tolerable. Now we know the naked truth. War knows no law except that of might. The atom bomb brought an empty victory to the Allied arms, but it resulted for the time being in destroying the soul of Japan. What has happened to the soul of the destroying nation is yet too early to see. Forces of nature act in a mysterious manner. We can but solve the mystery by deducing the unknown result from the known results of similar events. A slaveholder cannot hold a slave without putting himself or his deputy in the cage holding the slave. Let no one run away with the idea that I wish to put in a defense of Japanese misdeeds in pursuance of Japan's unworthy ambition. The difference was only one of degree. I assume that Japan's greed was, was more unworthy, but the greater unworthiness conferred no right on the less unworthy of destroying without mercy men, women, and children of Japan in a particular area. The moral to be legitimately drawn from the supreme tragedy of the bomb is that it will not be destroyed by counter bombs, even as violence cannot be by counter violence. Mankind has to get out of violence only through nonviolence. Hatred can be overcome only by love. Counter hatred only increases the surface as well as the depth of hatred. I am aware that I am repeating what I have many times stated before and practiced to the best of my ability and capacity. What I first stated was itself nothing new. It was as old as the hills. Only I recited no copybook maxim, but definitely announced what I believed in every fiber of my being. 60 years of practice in various walks of life has only enriched the belief which experience of friends have has fortified. It is, however, the central truth by which one can stand alone without flinching. I believe in what Max Müller said years ago, namely, that truth needed to be repeated as long as there were men who disbelieved it. Then he gave an interview to um, Daily Herald Gandhi was gloomy about the world situation. He thought that there would be another war in less than 10 years time, which was true, by the way, the Korean War. As for the atom bomb, Gandhiji did not agree with the correspondent's suggestion that its frightfulness would force nonviolence on the world. On the contrary, Gandhiji's view was that the violent man's eyes light up with the prospect of much greater amount of destruction and death, which he would now wreak. Kanichi told the correspondent that there would be no real freedom in India until the untouchables were free. He, however, pointed out that untouchables suffered from no legal disabilities like the Negroes in the United States and the Indians and other Asiatics in South and East Africa. He had a, um, a talk with an English journalist, and he asked him for the atom bomb. And Gandhi asked uh, in 1946, oh, on that point, you can proclaim to the whole world without hesitation that I am beyond repair. I regard the employment of the atom bomb for the wholesale destruction of men, women, and children as the most diabolical use of science. And then the question of the journalist was, uh, what is the antidote? Has it antiquated nonviolence? And Gandhi responded, no, it is the only thing the atom bomb cannot destroy. I did not move a muscle when I first heard that the atom bomb had wiped out Hiroshima. On the contrary, I said to myself, unless now the world adopts nonviolence, it will spell certain suicide for mankind.
And uh, let us remember, and there is an audio document we published on, uh, on YouTube, on, on the internet, and uh, the, in a very good quality, in English language speech of Mahatma Gandhi at the Inter-Asian Relations Conference on 2nd of April, 1947 in Delhi. And, uh, you know, he, he referred to the fact that the real India is in the heart of a sweeper of a Bangi and uh, that uh, the truth can be found there. But then he also referred to the, the danger of the atom bomb in the end. And he said, mm, of course, I believe in one world. How can I possibly do otherwise? Because he always referred to the prophets of the East, of the, of the sages who talked wisdom from Buddha uh, to uh, Mahavira, etc. So it was a, a real uh, uh, message which he gave in this speech. And he said, the West, in the end, the West is today pining for wisdom. It is despairing of the multiplication of the atom bomb, because atom bombs mean utter destruction, not merely of the West, but of the whole world, as if the prophecy of the Bible was going to be fulfilled and there was to be a perfect deluge. It is up to you to tell the world of its wickedness and sin. That is the teaching your teachers and my teachers have taught Asia. And in a talk with Congress workers in 1947, he uh, confirmed, my faith in nonviolence and truth is being strengthened all the more in spite of the increasing numbers of atom bombs. I have not a sh shadow of doubt that there is no power superior to the power of truth and nonviolence in the world. See what a great difference there is between the two. One is moral and spiritual force and is motivated by infinite soul force. The other is the product of physical and artificial power, which is perishable. The soul is imperishable. This doctrine is not my invention. It is a doctrine enunciated in our Vedas and Shastras. When soul force awakens, it becomes irresistible and conquers the world. The power is inherent in every human being, but one can succeed only if one tries to realize this ideal in each and every act in one's life without being affected in the least by praise or censure. And, uh, and then he talked with Englishmen and briefly commented, it is wrong to say that the people in the West have gone crazy about the atom bomb. There are also people among them who are having second thoughts about it. I can make this assertion in full faith and with conviction that people will be happy and content only where truth and nonviolence are followed. And in a discussion with Indonesian visitors, he said, the nonviolence which we practiced was not that of the brave, it was passive resistance. If we could have practiced nonviolence of the brave, there wouldn't have been this fratricidal carnage which is taking place now. That was in 1947. Spiritual courage is more important than physical courage. If therefore, not only India, but the whole of Asia practiced nonviolence of the brave, Asia would have a different status. Nonviolence, said Gandhi, is the only thing which can counteract any kind of atom bomb. That was in July 9, 1947. So you see, I'm relentlessly quoting Gandhi now. And there are so many aspects in his comments of, uh, uh, about the atom bomb. Uh, and I, I will drop one of these comments, a very interesting dialogue with the general and praising the courage, of course, of soldiers, but uh, recommending him to think about his means and methods. So, but there's an interview uh, by Vincent Sheen shortly before his assassination. You know, 
Gandhi was assassinated end of January 1948. And a few days before, he made uh, very remarkable comments on the atom bomb. In an inter interview to Vincent Sheehan, he said, the claim, they claim that the atom bomb changed the entire course of the war and brought the end of war so much the nearer. And yet it is so far. Has it conquered the Japanese spirit? It has not and it cannot. Has it crushed Germany as a nation? It has not and it cannot. To do that would require resorting to Hitler's method. And to what purpose? In the end, it will be Hitlerism that will have triumphed. Very remarkable. And uh, in the last interview to Margaret Borg White, uh, Gandhi uh, said something for me, uh, breathtaking, I tell you, that was uh, in January 29, 1948. Uh, she asked, would you advise America to give up the manufacture of atom bombs? And he said, most certainly. As things are, the war ended disastrously and the victors are vanquished by jealousy and lust for power. Already a third war is being canvassed, which may pro prove even more disastrous. Already a third war is being canvassed, which may prove even more disastrous. Ahimsa is a mightier weapon by far than the atom bomb. Even if the people of Hiroshima could have died in their thousands with prayer and goodwill in their hearts, the situation would have been transformed as if by a miracle. How would you meet the atom bomb with nonviolence? Gandhi was then asked. And now listen, please, to his words. It's breathtaking. How would you meet the atom bomb with nonviolence? Gandhi's answer. I will not go underground. I will not go into shelter. I will come out in the open and let the pilot see I have not the trace of ill will against him. The pilot will not see our faces from this great height. I know, but the longing in our hearts that he will not come to harm would reach up to him and his eyes would be opened. If those thousands who were done to death in Hiroshima had died with that prayerful action, died openly with that prayer in their hearts, their sacrifice would not have gone in vain. Now, coming back to the present, 2020, uh, uh, peace declaration, city of Hiroshima. Uh, there was a, uh, there's a mayor, this um, Matsui Kazumi, the mayor of the city of Hiroshima, he publishes each year a peace declaration. And in 2019, uh, he referred explicitly to Mahatma Gandhi. Turning to the world, we do see that individuals have little power, but we also see many examples of the combined strength of multitudes achieving their goal. Indian independence is one such example. Mahatma Gandhi, who contributed to that independence through personal pain and suffering, left us these words. Intolerance is itself a form of violence and an obstacle to the growth of a true democratic spirit. To confront our current circumstances and achieve a peaceful, sustainable world, we must transcend differences of status or opinion and strive together in a spirit of tolerance toward our ideal. To accomplish this, coming generations must never dismiss the atomic bombings and the war as mere events of the past. It is vital that they internalize the progress that Hibak Shah, the survivors of Hiroshima, and others have made toward a peaceful world 
then drive steadfastly forward. So that was the mayor of Hiroshima explicitly referring to Gandhi in his peace declaration on August 6, 2019. And in 2020, the same mayor in his peace declaration referred to our situation now. Humanity struggles now against a new threat, the novel coronavirus. However, with what we have learned from the tragedies of the past, we should be able to overcome this threat. When the 1918 flu pandemic attacked a century ago, it took tens of millions of lives and terrorized the world because nations fighting World War I were unable to meet the threat together. A subsequent upsurge in nationalism led to World War II and the atomic bombings. And then the mayor of uh, Hiroshima, Matsui Kazumi, concluded, we must never allow this painful past to repeat itself. Civil society must reject self-centered nationalism and unite against all threats. So now coming back to the Nuremberg Principles. What is the contents of the Nuremberg Principles? They are very short. There are seven principles, as we know. And uh, if you read them, it's very, very clear. These principles, a uh, set of guidelines, determine what constitutes crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Principle one says, any person who commits an act which constitutes a crime under international law is responsible therefore and liable to punishment. Principle two says, the fact that internal law does not impose a penalty for an act which constitutes a crime under international law does not relieve the person who committed the act from responsibility under international law. Principle three says, the fact that a person who committed an act which constitutes a crime under international law acted as head of state or responsible government official does not relieve him from responsibility under international law. And principle four says, fact that a person acted pursuant to order of his government or of a superior does not relieve him from responsibility under international law, provided a moral choice was in fact possible to him, a moral choice. Principle five, any person charged with a crime under international law has the right to a fair trial on the facts and law. And now the very essential principle six, which uh, define, defines crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Crimes uh, which are punishable as crimes, A, crimes against peace, which is the planning preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances. Second, participation in a common plan or conspiracy or for the accomplishment of any of the acts mentioned under one. You know, this term war of aggression is referring to the Brion Kellogg Pact, which was a unanimous uh, decision uh, brought about by two politicians in, in the end of the 20s against any wars of aggression. Of course, we know that this is not enough. In the, even the preamble of the United Charter now uh, speaks that the war is a scourge of humanity, a plague. You can say, uh, if you ban war, you must need ban all war. Uh, but uh, even in the Second World War, this was, uh, one can say, international law uh, in a way that uh, wars of aggression were banned. So all dictators pretend to just uh, lead a war of defense, just to defend. So everything is for defense and security. But it's a preparation of war, of extermination. 
and um, now war crimes. These are violations of the laws or customs of war, which include, but are not limited to murder, ill treatment or deportation to slave labor or for any other purpose of civilian population of or in occupied territory. Murder or ill treatment of prisoners of war or persons on the seas, killing of hostages, plunder of public or private property, wanton destruction of cities, towns or villages or devastation not justified by military necessity, whatever this means. C, crimes against humanity. Murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation and other inhuman acts, inhuman acts done against any, against any civilian population. Or persecutions on political, racial or religious grounds when such acts are done or such persecutions are carried on in execution of or in connection with any crime against peace or any war crime. And the complicity, this is a very important principle seven, the last one, the complicity in the commission of a crime against peace, a war crime or a crime against humanity is a crime under inter international law. So there, there's no, uh, it's not possible to be a bystander, an onlooker, you know, someone who is uh, tolerating the crimes of others without interfering. There is a moral duty to intervene, to prevent a crime from taking place before it is committed. What does it mean for us? Well, this is an interesting question, but coming back to Hiroshima 1945, coming back to the uh, Nuremberg Charter, the International Military Tribunal, the, um, the Nuremberg principles, we shall not neglect one particular aspect, which was also essential feature of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because it was a, uh, and this is the, the last uh, point I want to make. This was, you know, it was really a, a scientific aspect in this, you know, the effect of radiation, which uh, came into consciousness only in the 50s after some fishermen in the Pacific were contaminated by nuclear testings. And I would now uh, give you some advice to read uh, one our catalog, you find our catalog. Uh, of uh, Albert Schweitzer's, Dr. Albert Schweitzer's uh, commitment against uh, nuclear weapons, uh, which we published with the Free University. And uh, this is uh, following Albert Einstein, who was appreciating Gandhi, as well as Albert Schweitzer did. So uh, this is the exhibition which I uh, give you the information about, which you find uh, in English language about Dr. Albert Schweitzer ethics of the respect for life, the reference for life, combined with his political commitment against nuclear war. But um, I want to uh, draw your attention to this uh, very important fact that the Nuremberg uh, principles were accompanied by the Nuremberg Code a set of research ethics principles uh, for scientists, this is essential. It's like the Hippocratic Oath, uh, Oath of Hippocrates, Oath of Hippocrates for medical uh, scientists, for doctors. Uh, it is, uh, and this Nuremberg Code was created as a result of the Nuremberg trials at the end of the Second World War. Nuremberg as the place where the uh, trials against the war criminals took place in the Palace of Justice, which is now a remarkable museum. There's also an international uh, Nuremberg Principles Academy now in Nuremberg, and there's activity for human rights now in Nuremberg, uh, also an alley for human rights uh, built by a very famous sculptor, Pillars of the Human Rights Declaration the Universal Charter uh, Declaration of Human, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the Nuremberg Code now, because it's not so well known, 
this is, uh, is explicitly referring to human experimentation. So you can uh, call the uh, unspeakable horrors of, and crimes of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, as, uh, as huge uh, experiments to see the result, the effect of uh, radiation and also, uh, also um, mm, this is a concerted effort. And you know that these bombs should have been dropped on uh, Berlin because uh, Berlin was the place where the decisions were made uh, for the genocide against the Jewish people and the uh, um, extermination of gypsy people, uh, Sinti and Roma, you know, um, and so many other groups, victim groups of the Nazis. The Nazis were anti-Semitic racists, racist, and uh, they were um, uh, having an idea of a world domination, and they wanted to um, conquer the world uh, uh, with the racist superiority complex. You can say they had an ideology which was aggressive, and this was uh, the reason why the atom bomb was uh, um, invented, actually, that's the idea, that was the idea why Albert Einstein consented to the development of the atom bomb. But uh, what he did not consent to was that it had be, it is dropped on cities, neither German cities nor Japanese cities. That was not the intention of Albert Einstein. And now, Coming back to the Nuremberg Code, and this is important in our age of gene technology, biotechnology, uh, and also uh, in the still active danger of uh, new uh, nuclear confrontation. You see, uh, the turn points of the Nuremberg Code, um, permissible medical experiments, uh, they are very clear because they are referring to the human dignity as the basic principle, the, the right of life, the right to life and physical inviolability. This is important. Nothing without consensus. This is the idea behind the, these 10 points of the Nuremberg Code, which are not famous. That's the reason why I quote them. Otherwise, I wouldn't do that. First, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Second, the experiment should be such as to yield fruitful results for the good of society, unprocurable by other methods or means of study and not random and unnecessary in nature. This was the second point, second of 10. And now you see the reference to uh, the, the search for a new vaccine against the virus of the global pandemic. And, uh, and the experiments which are taking place during these uh, very days, during these very moments. Yeah. Third, the experiment should be so designed and based on the results of animal experimentation and a knowledge of the natural history of the disease or other problem under study that the anticipated results will justify the performance of the experiments. Fourth, the experiment should be so conducted as to avoid all unnecessary physical and mental suffering and injury. Five, no experiment should be conducted where there is an a priori reason to believe that death or disabling injury will occur, except perhaps in those experiments where the experimental physicians also serve as subjects. Six, the degree of risk to be taken should never exceed that determined by the humanitarian importance of the problem to be solved by the experiment. Seven, proper preparations should be made and adequate facilities provided to protect the experimental subject against even remote possibilities of injury, disability, or death. Eight, the experiment should be conducted only by scientifically qualified persons. The highest degree of skill and care should be required through all stages of the experiment of those who conduct or engage in the experiment. Nine, 
During the course of the experiment, the human subject should be at liberty to bring the experiment to an end if he has reached the physical or mental state where continuation of the experiment seems to him to be impossible. And 10, during the course of the experiment, the scientist in charge must be prepared to terminate the experiment at any stage if he has probable cause to believe in the exercise of the good faith, superior skill and careful judgment required of him that the continuation of the experiment is likely to result in injury, disability and, or death to the experimental subject. Now, can you imagine this Nuremberg code and these Nuremberg principles would have been applied by President Harry S. Truman and uh, General Groves and others before the decision was made during the time of the Potsdam Conference uh, to drop the bombs on Hiroshima, Nagasaki and Kyoto. And what a grace that the third bomb had not been dropped on Kyoto. So we contemporaries of the nuclear age in this hardest times of a global pandemic should now think about the message of Mahatma Gandhi with respect to the Nuremberg principles of the international law. And we should support an international manifesto against the military system. against conscription, military conscription, of course, but also against the military system as a united effort. And uh, such a uh, manifesto we have spread successfully for many, more than 20 years, signed by eminent Indian artists, scientists, and also followers of Mahatma Gandhi, of course, also the uh, wonderful granddaughter, Ila Gandhi, for example, or the grandson of Leo Tolstoy. And we would like to invite you to see this uh, website, the manifesto.info. But uh, we would also like to invite you to come into a dialogue with us. And thank you for your attention. And I'm very uh, keen to know which kind of questions might uh, might occur and if I'm able to respond to them somehow. Thank you. And uh, thank you again for your invitation. Dr. Jango and uh, I hope I could a bit fulfill your expectations. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, it's more than our expectation. It was a very peaceful lecture is a kind of a really non-violence and peaceful lecture on the very hot topic as a nuclear age, nuclear bomb, weapons, violence we see across the world. But your lecture is really a peaceful message and uh, you, re you reconnected the nuclear weapon, violence and the international principle of a, a war criminals, and uh, also the Gandhian principle of nonviolence. So uh, thank you, sir. We are really elaborate and enlightened and a really uh, interest generating lecture. I appreciate your uh, the way of deliberation and deliberation. And uh, really, you address uh, uh, most of our doubts and our questions also. And uh, I now invite uh, the participants uh, uh, for uh, your uh, uh, chat, the live chat for the, uh, please put your question uh, in question box. Question answer box is open. So please put your questions uh, in the chat box, question chat answer chat box. So I, I have a couple of questions as from a, a participants, attendees.
or a uh, issue. So the very kind of a uh, is, uh, is interested question. Uh, one participant is Shikanta Mohapatra. He his question is very uh, is, uh, is theoretical and interesting. Uh, is, sir, uh, is, are you listening me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the question is a could Gandhi be called as a social conflict theorist? So as that uh, Sashikanta Mahapatra is asking that uh, can Gandhi be a social uh, conflict theorist? Now we have so many social conflicts. Every society, country, state, we see the lot of a uh, social conflict. And uh, how to resolve, how to solve this kind of social conflict on the base, uh, we see that the uh, violent nature of the social conflict. So can Gandhi be a, a social conflict theorist? Uh, what is your uh, sir, response? Yeah, I think, I think so, yes. Uh, yesterday I attended a workshop for political education organized by the land of Berlin. It was a workshop of education against anti-Semitism, you know, against hatred and prejudices. So this is a remarkable uh, message we can learn from Mahatma Gandhi, this, uh, um, this desire to have an intercultural dialogue, an interreligious dialogue, uh, an active dialogue with atheists, you know, because Gandhi, um, after some time in his life, he said, it's, it's not that God is truth, but truth is God. So it should be also understood by atheists and somehow, yeah, because truth is much more important than any other message. And the way to truth is through nonviolence. This is important. So it's not a matter of belief, uh, com competing beliefs, or, but it's, a, it's a, trying to get the essence, ethical essence, the, the essence of wisdom, uh, through all the religions and all the, the ideas of science. And also be critical against any kind of um, danger, uh, for example, in scientific approaches, but also in rel religious ideologies. So if you, um, if you try to find the peaceful streams in the religions, these are different interpretations of the religious scripts, for example. So you, you should have an active dialogue, yeah? because in the end, we need a, we have no other choice than to, to create a liberal democracy or let me say a democratic socialism, or you can also say a, a, a society where the human rights for all are respected, the welfare of all, this was Gandhi's idea. That's the reason why, yes, of course, social conflicts shall be referring to Gandhi's concept of Savodaya, the uplift of all, the uh, advancement of all. And, um, and Gandhi referred to John Ruskin. John Ruskin was a, a critic of, of the political economy of his age. He was a, a kind of, Chris, I would say, he was a independent thinker. He was a, an alternative Karl Marx, yeah? So he was referring to the weak points of the British society very early in the Victorian age in the 19th century. Gandhi referred, explicitly referred to him and, uh, and read his books. Uh, so we should, re uh, we should read not, not just Mahatma Gandhi, but also those sources which influenced him like uh, John Ruskin's plea for equality, for equal rights, for a guaranteed minimum income, not minimum, guaranteed income, so that people have a dignified life. Uh, it is John Ruskin's Until This Last, referring to the parable of the workers in the vineyard uh, in the New Testament, but then paraphrased by Gandhi in Gujarati language and then reintroduced, uh, retranslated into English. Uh, Savodaya is, became a, a concept of a constructive program for Indian society. And you, you find this book also in the Gandhi Heritage Portal. You find this book in English language with all the different points elaborated by the Kumarapas, the, 
by Vinod Babavi. So it was uh, really put into practice and uh, it was uh, giving response to the, 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 the question, uh, who is owning the land? He who works on it, of course. And, uh, um, and this is going back to the, the problem of poverty in the 19th century and the wrong responses by scientists like Malthus. The criticism of Tolstoy, his plea for land tax concepts of Henry George and Gandhi's plea for John Ruskin's concept and then as a basis for his Phoenix settlement in, in South Africa now, very relevant again. And also we should read Henry David Thoreau uh, and his, his plea for in, emancipation from slavery through civil disobedience. And all the, the following forms of semi-slavery, this was Gandhi's term, uh, like indentured labor. And so you know there are so many forms of indentured labor which are caused even by fellow countrymen, not just by imperialists or colonialists. This is important. So you, you need to reread and re-understand Gandhi to find clues for nowadays, nowadays, and you can do it easily nowadays because we all have access to the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi through the Gandhi Heritage Portal and the fundamental works of Gandhi and his uh, interesting enlightening thoughts and this was just one example referring to the problem of the nuclear the problem is the nuclear age the nuclear age is the problem you know and this is caused by science politics and science and you know gandhi also quoted the several so the seven social sins i i i was not prepared to to repeat them by heart you see but please read the seven social sins gandhi was uh, explicitly uh, reproducing them in the collected works, the seven social sins. And so this intercultural and interreligious dialogue on the local community level is uh, essential to establish peace among people and to, uh, to bring about a just society with equal equality, equal rights, which is so hard, but this is the idea of a democratic socialism, of a liberal democracy. Yes, um, and another question. Is there any other question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, there are uh, many questions, sir. Some are uh, uh, just uh, uh, you already answered related to that. One question that is uh, very interesting that uh, uh, now is uh, the question is that uh, today we have a kind of a two fronts of war as a um, one is economic cause uh, that we have the like a pandemic so we have lockdown economy almost is a down lockdown and uh, the recession job uh, lose we see so one side economic cause and another side social unrest so how we can make a peace say, as a balance say, uh, in, in the time of pandemic that one side our economy and other side is also unrest and how we can make a balance between two using the Gandhian principle of peace. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, first of all, referring to the economic causes of war Gandhi always expressed these are uh, essential causes, economic causes for wars. He was invited to join the War Resistance International Triennial Meeting in Austria. And instead, uh, General Prasad gave a message from his uh, side. And Gandhi wanted to express the, the fact that every pacifist shall be concerned about the social and economical uh, causes for war. And Aldous Huxley, added to that the psychological causes of war, which he uh, explained in a BBC lecture in 1934. And Aldous Huxley was the most authentic follower of Gandhi in the West in the 30s. So we, we should certainly uh, reread also what, what was Gandhi speaking uh, about, um, what was his explanation of the causes, economic causes of war. Yeah? And so this would be another lecture. But then uh, I would like to, uh, to tell you that 
for me, uh, from my point of view, it is a very interesting uh, double uh, challenge, double challenge for us. One is the equal distribution, you know, uh, the people have equal opportunities. This is a key word in the US election campaign, as you know, opportunities. So equal opportun opportunities should be the basis. If there are not equal opportunities, we have to produce them. At least if, if I find someone who is shelterless in a kind of uh, uh, illegal alien without a uh, stay permit. So I want to help him. I did so two days ago here in my district. So I, I have this my moral responsibility to support him, to uh, inform people to support him, although he has no, no rights whatsoever. He has no right for a lawyer. He came from the Bahamas just to tell you, this is just an example. Yeah? So uh, these are not just people from Africa also, but they, these are climate change refugees, which are not accepted as, as such. Yeah? So for example, this is a, just one example of, of many that we have to uh, take our moral responsibility each day to care for those who have no secure status, to give them equal opportunities and equal basic conditions. Or, uh, second is mm, when I was invited for a lecture in Africa House about uh, Gandhi's uh, mm, emancipation struggle in, in, in South Africa and his, uh, his contribution to the creation of the African National Congress against any kind of racism and against, uh, um, against this system of uh, semi-slavery, which I already explained, then I, I, I saw that this is a meeting point for those uh, people living in Berlin who, uh, who want to uh, create their own culture, you know, by being uh, independent thinkers and also uh, trying to, to uh, contribute to the good luck multinational German society, yes. As I told you, in a liberal pluralist democracy, we have people from different backgrounds. And this is important to teach each other or to inform each other at least, to share experience. And this is important to listen and to uh, share opportunities, to create equal opportunities to uh, on the one hand. And the second is, uh, it is obviously so that there should be a kind of um, um, public, uh, independent public investigation. What is going wrong in Germany as well as in India, by the way? So what is going wrong in politics and the administration? What is going wrong? Why were people informed so lately? Why have they not been informed earlier? Why have have not been prepared. Why were there either no plans? But in Germany, there were plans. They were not realized. Why were the plans for such a, a situation as we are facing with the global pandemic were not uh, practiced? Uh, why were they not realized? So there should be an independent investigation. And of course, uh, we had this with the Vietnam War, the uh, Russell Tribunal. So we, we, we have to uh, create our own international uh, and also national investigations uh, and also um, tribunals, yeah, so that uh, heads of states will uh, be taken responsible for, for the good deeds and the bad deeds, we would say, for the omissions and for, uh, for the crimes. And there are many crimes connected with the global pandemics of the past. Uh, it's not just, uh, you know, a, 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 an accident or some, um, something which could not be anticipated. No, no, not at all. That was not the first uh, global pandemic so far. But there should be, uh, this is the second challenge. We should act against any kind of alternative facts or fake news. We should act against any spreading of hatred or of any conspiracy theories or blaming others, scapegoating others. This is important because it's so easy to remove your own responsibility by blaming others. It makes you feel uh, good. It feels, it makes, uh, it seems to uh, be the basis for creating unity, but this is not 
this is not truthful. This is not, uh, this is not uh, uh, the challenge we face that we, uh, we have. It's a difficult way to find out the truth on the local, regional, national and international level, but we should find out the truth. So for journalists, this might be uh, a very uh, great challenge, uh, of course, but not only, also for those people doing social work, they should really publish uh, uh, the conditions, the, the bad conditions they face during the uh, professional time of work because they are responsible that people are cared for, you know, health is priority. First health and life and then everything else. So first the freedom to breathe and then all other freedoms, you know, that is important uh, to, to uh, publish uh, the bad working conditions. So to improve, of course, for approval, not, not to, uh, you know, not, uh, not as a destructive form of criticism, but a constructive form of criticism to improve the social conditions, the working conditions. And this is, uh, this has been uh, caused a crisis because this, the weaknesses of our social systems have been uh, revealed through this global pandemic, one of the effects. And the other effect is that I was invited to speak to you today. Thank you. Yeah, very explanatory answer. And really, I uh, good question and a good answer. Everywhere we see the problem and uh, the solution uh, lies in Gandhi principle ideology. So, sir, one question from my side. Uh, is I want to ask a uh, very as a kind of a uh, dilemma related question as I uh, we, we see that uh, nuclear weapons around us and we are sitting on the heap of a nuclear weapon uh, is, is the nuclear weapons are a, uh, is creating balance of power uh, in the international politics. So that's why it's uh, not having third world war the because of nuclear weapons. Cancer the peace, the, the peace and non-violence and uh, uh, idealism or especially the Gandhianism uh, can play a role of like a uh, balance between idealism and realism. So that is a, a question uh, is why uh, is there is no balance of peace uh, but uh, in the international uh, community but uh, there is balance of uh, war or like uh, power because of nuclear weapon so how you yeah, thank you for your question <clears throat> this question relates to the imperfect uh, state of our international system we have we are not living in the in the in the world of a world federation world Republic on uh, a federal basis with the uh, guaranteed equality of the members. It's not so. We are uh, living in a world where you find the United Nations with the wonderful United Nations International Days um, uh, rem reminding us of our duties and our challenges. Uh, very fine international days against chemical weapons, against uh, nuclear tests, uh, for nonviolence on 2nd October, of course, uh, and for peace, uh, end of September, and also uh, many others uh, against um, child soldiers, you can say, against uh, the, the misuse of children and the violation against children, and, and so many other international days which are uh, of relevance with respect to the military system. But we are not living in a world federation with a constitution where there is no military, just a kind of police with a control, strict control. Uh, we are not living in, uh, in such, uh, because there are hierarchies, uh, there are, um, uh, there is a, a kind of um, um, 
scourge of war going on. It's a kind of ongoing third world war with civil wars now, more civil wars than wars, as we know, between nations. And, um, and also internal uh, domestic violence caused by uh, uh, cartels and uh, mafia organizations, etc., but also a huge corruption problem. And all this is possible because there is not an international um, federal structure uh, with a world citizenship, with equal rights for all uh, members of mankind uh, and uh, with uh, rules which are referring to all the members of mankind. And why? Because still there is, uh, I would say, the, the danger of nationalism, which is ongoing. It's, it has never, never stopped. Although we, we, we learn from the message of Rabindranath Tagore, he was an outspoken critic of nationalism. And he was the messenger of India. And uh, so there is still a great uh, misunderstanding of what means uh, uh, independence, not only uh, politically, but also economically. That means um, it is uh, the, the chimera of autarky. Uh, there is a, not an understanding of a peaceful uh, um, network of mutuality, which was envisaged by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And this uh, inescapable network of mutuality, which, uh, which, which, based, which is based on the, the, the peaceful messengers, uh, would substitute the military system. Because uh, this is not just a matter of, uh, of uh, a coincidence uh, whether there is war or not, or a nona second, or a second strike capability, uh, capability or mutual assured destruction or flexible response or whatever are these uh, terms which are used and collateral damage uh, for civilians who, who are killed. Uh, so this is a logic which is uh, diabolical and this is uh, high time now to bring about a change on an international level. That's the reason why I'm particularly glad that you invited me from India because there's an, inter there's an urge for international cooperation to bring about a new uh, structure. And this can uh, be started from Mizoram University or from Free University or wherever, but it can also be brought about by continuing our dialogue and co uh, cooperation and dialogue, which is important and also by uh, strengthening such a money, international manifesto, which cannot be denied and which, uh, which is now uh, visible. And uh, of course, we are, we are not living in an in a innocent world and there are always dangers, but nevertheless, I think we should uh, try to uh, carry on the message of nonviolence. And this was not uh, Gandhi who was the first, as we know, Gandhi was uh, um, the brightest exponent and certainly the man of the century for, for me, uh, but there were also um, followers of Gandhi, like uh, <clears throat> very intelligent followers of Gandhi, like Aldous Huxley I, I mentioned, uh, but there were also precursors, you know, the abolitionists, William Lloyd Garrison uh, in uh, the United States with his declaration of sentiments, then Henry David Thoreau, civil disobedience, and nonviolent non-cooperation principle of Leo Tolstoy. But how to organize <clears throat> by an association of, of bright intellectuals by, or, <clears throat> or communicating foci, uh, by an association of individuals, perhaps? Yeah, why not? Because it's individual responsibility. Or we, we shall not wait for a group or organization to take up the cause, no. It, maybe this is the only chance, an association of individuals, yes. But on an equal basis, you know, the structure is important. 
on the, uh, the basis of equal rights without hierarchy, this is important. And this uh, technology we use enables us to, to share experience and ideas, which I, which I find uh, of great use for such an intercultural and interreligious dialogue and also for such aspiration to transform our societies to a world federation without military as cancer. It is a cancer. We are living in a cancer system. And each uh, moment is um, a moment of danger. We, we do not know, we do not see, but even, you know, in my country, we are in a constant danger, particularly in the 80s of the last century, there, was, uh, there were uh, accidents uh, which could have caused the third world war. But even nowadays, we face uh, grave problems and you, uh, you know how, how responsible we all are to keep up the good relations between uh, our uh, nation and the, uh, the neighboring nations, uh, which is uh, particularly important for Europeans after these, uh, this bloody European history. So um, what, what can I say? I, I, we have no other choice. Um, uh, Actually, Gandhi is, is right to say, of course, uh, if you keep up this system of fear, you know, the fear is the basis for the Leviathan of Thomas Hobbes. Uh, my friend said, my good friend said, so fear, the system of fear. Uh, if you want to keep up the system of fear, okay, you can go on with, uh, with even worse weapons. Yeah? Maybe some small insects which will kill you. Uh, without someone noticing you, yeah? with the microelectronics yeah? coming into your room, you are, you are dead. Nobody knows why you died because a small insect uh, killed you. A weapon system of the 21st century. Yeah? So this is not science fiction. So don't worry, yeah? don't worry. Uh, it's, um, there, are, there are so um, insidious um, fascist tactics of, uh, and Militarism and fascism is linked, you know, and, and Gandhi knew that he warned democracies to militarize because they it would be just a, a matter of degree, the violence, not just an essential difference. Democracy shall have an essential difference to dictatorship. There should be no more dictatorship. And for me, it's hard to bear the fact that um, there are members of the United Nations which uh, have been uh, dictatorships or one-party democracies. It's, it's, it's hard to, hard to bear, swallow, you know. So even, and then you know how important it is to care for fair elections. So difficult nowadays. It's even more difficult. So we, we've, we have to find a way to secure the basic human rights and fair elections you know, fair elections, what, that, what does it mean? You know? Fair election, what is, this is a huge uh, challenge. Are there alternatives to elections? I don't, see, I don't see them so far. Are there alternatives to party systems? Of course, there are alternatives, but have not been practiced. So uh, enlightened anarchy, that was the idea of Gandhi. Enlightened anarchy, controlled anarchy, a structure, it's not chaos, it's enlightened anarchy. And, uh, and the weakest shall be the, the center and the village republic uh, model for the world. So this is uh, the idea, it's a decentralized structure, if sure, with decentralized uh, mm, energy systems, like solar energy and soft energies, sure. But uh, we have to find a world federation structure at the same time. It's not just a matter of a solution for Germany or India, but also an international uh, alternative. And this can be developed by a reform of the United Nations, but it can also be uh, brought about by some, uh, some collaboration on a common vision. And that's essential, uh, dialogue. The dialogue is essential. Otherwise, um, it's easy to discredit or uh, to discredit someone or to spoil his reputation 
uh, it's better to have a joint effort and to bring about a new uh, structure. And uh, this shall be debated uh, on a high level, not only uh, uh, among uh, good willing academics or intellectuals. Mm. That's also a, a matter of concern for people who are doing uh, works as farmers, gardeners, or craftsmen. They are, uh, they are dependent on a new vision for a world federation. And this is what we can learn from Mahatma Gandhi. Thank you, sir. Mm. If, if you permit, I, can I, I put two more small questions. Questions are small and answer also a, a small, I expecting. Uh, the very uh, pertinent question uh, nowadays uh, is the youth. The youth are a peacemaker, peace messenger, and the future generation of the world. And uh, we see that uh, youth are peaceful if they are engaged or if they are working or if they are happy as a job education if the, there is a uh, is less of job and uh, the education also disturbing and or costly and then uh, there will be unrest uh, in youth so one side we see that gandhi he also uh, emphasized uh, upon uh, youth the uh, children, uh, their mind, their mind should be uh, used for the peace and um, they have a lot of energy. So how uh, the youth's uh, unrest can be converted into peace? Uh, and that is a very challenging question in today's world. Thank you, sir. Indeed, uh, this is a key question because uh, Many young people feel that uh, there's no contract between the generations. On the other hand, there is a uh, danger of ageism. That means that people are discriminated because they are of a higher age, even me, myself, and not just uh, with reference to the, to the job market, but also in society as, a, as an old white man in my society, uh, I, I, get, I get prejudices. So someone uh, doesn't ask, people do not ask of my personal background. They judge me by the skin of my, uh, my by the color of my skin, the white skin. And this is a minor, I am in a minority and this is uh, okay with me. But on the other hand, we have uh, not just the problem of ageism or, or, uh, or racism, but also the, the question of uh, speciesism. That means that uh, there are more and more species extincted by, by our behavior. And so the, because of climate change and uh, uh, ecological changes, there is uh, no guarantee for a sustainable future for, um, for, a, for, a, for a real contract between the generations. So yes. Young people will be the certainly young people. Uh, many of them, female, as we know, will be the promoters of a movement against climate change, reminding the governments to fulfill the obligations because the governments are usually dominated by old male uh, egos. <laughs> You can say, <laughs> yes, young people with all their wit and humor, with all their desire to live, their creativity, shall apply all possible means which are open to them because of liberal democracy. We want to create, in spite of our dissatisfaction with our parties, and we create, because there is a universal charter of human rights, we refer to, and it's our duty to fight for our rights non-violently. What does it mean fight? You know, nowadays, uh, uh, the conflict is 
uh, always a challenge to transcend the antagonism to a new kind of cooperation under new conditions. So of course, if there is no contract guaranteed, we should create the basis for a new contract between the generations. And this means that we should follow Tolstoy, that he can learn more from the peasant children than he can teach them. So we can learn a lot from children, from youngsters, not just because of their intelligence, not because of their creativity only, but their righteousness and their, uh, hopefully, a freedom to express their opinions. But as long as there are systems in our society which repress individuals to express their opinions freely, it will be difficult to listen to the free voice of young, young people, for old people. It will be difficult. They will not never hear. If, if there is fear in society, if there is repression and violence, uh, then we shall uh, try to open spaces for free dialogues, for free sh uh, sharing of experience and ideas, and also for creativity. This can be local, um, you know, coffee, ho coffee houses, or uh, could be also coffee houses, you know, where the trigger for a, a real motor for ideas of pacifism and vegetarianism in Russia and, and other in North Italy and Germany, Austria. So the, the free speech, the liberal democracy started fr from coffee houses yeah? uh, and also, of course, theaters and music. Music, and you mentioned music is a, an international language which can be understood. So I'm, I'm, uh, I think we can learn much. Of course, you have, you have very wise, wise musicians, uh, who made simple songs, which you can, uh, which you can learn by heart, and which you can sing. Um, and there are uh, songs which are also um, referring, for example, to the topic of my talk, of my lecture. The one I would like to recommend to you, which is very fine. It's a very subtle song. You should listen to it. I would like to uh, uh, to invite you to listen to following song. It's uh, "What Have They Done to the Rain." This is a very nice song. It's a very very soft, a gentle song against the nuclear fallout. Yeah. So please listen to this song. What have they done to the rain? What have they done to the rain? And this song was composed by Malvina Reynolds, a housewife from California, USA. Uh, and she um, dedicated her life to, to music for, for, for the people. And she, uh, she created wonderful, simple songs like God Bless the Grass from way up here. It isn't nice to block the doorway. It isn't nice to go to jail. There are nicer ways, uh, but the nice ways always fail. It isn't nice, it is nice. You told us once, you told us twice, but if that is freedom's price, you don't mind, we go to jail, you see? So this is uh, in the spirit of the civil rights movement, of the anti-nuke movement, of the peace movement, and also uh, this is the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Howard Thurman, Benjamin Mays, William uh, Dubois, and John Duber and um, Booker T. Washington, also um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa and his friends and collaborators. So Malvina Reynolds songs are simple, easy to understand, easy to sing in English language, which is an international medium like, uh, like you know, um, 
Arab, Chinese, Spanish, French, and um, uh, uh, this English medium, Russian, I forgot Russian, of course, Russian language is also an international medium. Don't forget that. And uh, this simple song uh, of my Wiener Reynolds, uh, these songs are quite close to the spirit of Gandhi and Tolstoy. So this uh, particular song referring to the nuclear fallout, uh, what have they done to the rain? Uh, this is very subtle and it, see, it seems to be uh, the best um, demonstration how you can bring about change, not by uh, raising your voice loud as a dictator, you know, we know all the chaplain's uh, speech uh, as the great dictator in, in, this, in this movie, Charlie Chaplin. Um, but um, he's, uh, it was a speech of freedom, um, um, a kind of um, satirical way to, to act against Hitler then. But uh, no, it's not a loud voice, it's a subtle, sometimes it's a, it's a gentle tune and a subtle, subtle message which makes you shudder sometime, which makes you think, because there's something strange. Uh, she describes the rain falling, but then it appears to be after some time, ah, this is not an ordinary rain which is falling. There's something mixed, uh, something evil inside this rain, and it's caused by human beings uh, which keep up the military system and which keep on producing nuclear weapons, which shall be abolished worldwide. So this is a wonderful um, example for a song which is referring to the topic of my lecture, uh, the relevance of the Nuremberg principles and of the nonviolent philosoph philosophy of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Leo Tolstoy and others, which were uh, inspired by Buddha by, by Lao Tzu, the Wu Wei, the non-doing principle, non-acting principle in the Tao Te Ching, and also by uh, the Sermon on the Mount of uh, Rab Rabbi uh, Isa Ibn uh, Nazareth, Jesus. So there is something uh, which we can learn from these songs, and not just from philosophy, or from uh, ethics, but also from these songs. And these songs are a wonderful uh, medium of communication. And not to mention wonder your wonderful Indian classical music. So thank you, Dr. Jango, for asking this question. I don't hear you. Oh. My, my mic was uh, unmute. Sir, can you uh, play the music uh, video or audio in your uh, laptop system? We can just uh, uh, enjoy for one minute, two minutes. So, so to, to share my, uh, yes, I can share my uh, screen if you like. Yeah. 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 Even uh, no need to share, just uh, we can listen the sound also without the okay. uh, video also. Okay, so um, then it, I pre prepare. It is possible, to play. It is yes. possible for you to play, the, click the play on this. Yeah, uh, one moment. Yes. Yes, sir. Nice. We are seeing on his screen. Okay. Fine. Yes, sir. 
Just a little rain falling all around. Nice, sir, nice. Off lifts its head to the heavenly sound. Just a little rain, just a little rain. What have they done to the rain? Just a little boy standing in the rain, the gentle rain that falls for years, and the grass is gone, the boy disappears, and rain keeps falling like helpless tears, and what have they done to the rain? Just a little breeze out of the sky. The leaves pat their hands as the breeze goes by. Just a little breeze with some smoke in its eye. What have they done to the rain? Just a little ball standing in the rain. The gentle rain that falls for years And the grass is gone The boy disappears And rain keeps falling Like helpless tears And what have they done to the rain? Thank you, sir. Yeah, very interesting, very kind of peace music and the sound and the, the musical instrument and the voice, very uh, peaceful. So it's, uh, this is a kind of a webinar. Uh, is our speaker uh, is really interested uh, is not only academic way, but also as a personal way. He is a kind of a uh, Gandhian friend for the peace, non-violence uh, across the world. So this is a, uh, today's a webinar, our speaker's lecture, um, very informative, enlightening, and also remarkable and in the time of pandemic, it will be memorable for all attendees or panelists and even for those are not attended, but they can download the lecture link, YouTube link on the university website, Facebook, sorry. So uh, the Facebook page of Mizoram University, uh, interested people can download. So I'm very thankful to the speaker, uh, Christian Bartol, for your nice interaction, very peaceful, very heartily. Uh, you touched our mind and heart uh, and uh, recalled the Gandhian uh, words, uh, his uh, uh, comments uh, after the uh, twin bombs burning on uh, as a Nagasaki, Hiroshima, and uh, he very well uh, narrated the scenario that uh, why uh, the Gandhi uh, is, uh, became silent for some days, for some time, and then after he, uh, he spoke uh, on the nuclear bomb. So as today also uh, we are living in nuclear age. Uh, as even though no use of nuclear weapon after 1945, but uh, always it is a fear. So 
and uh, that's so as you also elaborated the nuremberg principle of uh, international law related to uh, war crime so uh, really that uh, is your lecture benefited to uh, academician scholars uh, and those are uh, really human rights activists uh, working for the uh, poor people protecting their rights raising their voices so we are very uh, thankful for your uh, presentation and also you uh, without uh, taking break even you did not take a glass of water also during the your lecture so it is your energy and okay now <laughs> So it is your energy, your presence, and also your uh, kind of uh, uh, devotion to your words and your work. So thank you, sir, for your uh, nice deliberation. Hopefully, in future, we will again meet in fact, uh, on a similar topic related to Gandhi and uh, other also. So thanks, sir. Nice your participation, your uh, involvement and giving the answer response of the questions uh, some questions may be hit your mind uh, but uh, you really made a balance uh, while giving uh, response of the questions so thank you sir your nice uh, presentation and a smile and peace that you give us uh, through your words thank you sir welcome for future yeah much, Dr. Jango. We will like to continue our dialogue and hope uh, also dialogue with those who listen to us. Uh, all the best for your future, for our future. Thank you, sir. Thank you, participants, for your uh, attendance, your uh, joining, your questions, uh, your interest, uh, and uh, so many Without uh, your uh, involvement, your attendance, your uh, joining any webinar, virtual lecture, online interaction uh, is cannot be success. So the entire credit goes to the part attendees, the very uh, is important uh, for your uh, of your participation and your uh, interest. So uh, as the U University of Mizoram uh, is, uh, is uh, the today was the seventh of a series of Mahatma Gandhi webinar. Uh, earlier uh, is webinars on Gandhian uh, is, uh, is series. Uh, is one very important, the last webinar, the Arun Gandhi, the grandson of uh, Mahatma Gandhi himself uh, addressed and uh, his, uh, I'm just linking it uh, that uh, uh, today's your, uh, our speaker, Christian Bartok, uh, uh, speech and the Arun Gandhi's, both are very uh, uh, common, like uh, in, uh, in the many way, the Arun Gandhi's emphasis upon the youth, say, uh, children, as uh, the practical experience he shared uh, that uh, how Gandhi wanted uh, and the, and the change, transform the energy of youth angers into the constructive and peace. And the same way as our speaker, Christian Bartok, he also emphasized that the Gandhian principle of non-violence are only the solution of the present scenario of a no violence and conflict. And in uh, the Gandhian principle should be international law as our uh, speaker emphasized. So thank you uh, all participants and uh, our speaker. And that also the word of thanks. Uh, I'm organizing single person. So uh, my uh, honorable vice chancellor uh, is uh, having a meeting, online meeting. So he could not join or just give a thank words to our speaker. So that's why I'm also presenting the word of thank. As please accept the word of thank from our vice chancellor via me personally. Thank you, sir. So thank you all participants. I'm going to close the session. 
as the uh, sir uh, i request to our speaker uh, can you send the link uh, your uh, paper uh, your presentation the soft copy of uh, as a text uh, to my mail so i can uh, forward or send to those who are really interested or scholars thank you sir very like to yes sir. thank you sir really namaste namaste yeah bye jagat okay.